You know, it's, um, it's so interesting that uh, earlier this afternoon, uh, Marsha McNutt, and thinking back about the 1960s, uh, mentioned that there were a lot of men in suits. Uh, I'd like to read something uh, to you to kick off uh, the remainder of the afternoon uh, that I drew from uh, the NASA Langley Research Center website. It's called Standing on the Shoulders of a Computer. In 1967, Christine Darden was added to the pool of human computers who wrote complex programs and tediously crunched numbers for engineers at NASA's Langley Research Center. It was 22 years after the end of World War II, and female mathematicians before her gained respect in the field of data processing while men were away at war. But Darden wanted to do more than process the data. She wanted to create it. After wading through daily calculations for eight years, Darden decided that some deviation in her work was necessary. She confidently approached her supervisor to ask why men with the same educational background as her were being hired in as engineers. Stooped by her question and impressed by her skills, her supervisor transferred her to the engineering section where she was one of a few female aerospace engineers at NASA Langley during that time. Her first assignment was to write a computer program for Sonic Boom. That program launched a 25-year career of working sonic boom minimization. Dr. Darden has authored over 57 technical papers and articles, primarily in the areas of sonic boom prediction, sonic boom minimization, and supersonic wing design. She has been recognized with dozens of awards and honors, including the Women in Science and Engineering Lifetime Achievement Award. After nearly 40 years of service, she retired from NASA Langley Research Center as a member of the Senior Executive Service. Her final assignment at Langley was Director of the Office of Strategic Communications and Education. Please join me in welcoming Dr. Christine Darden. Thank you and good afternoon. I am um, Dr. Isaacson, USRA staff, speakers, and honored guests. It's an honor and a pleasure to be here this afternoon to participate in this, the 50th anniversary symposium of USRA. Uh, for the last two, two and a half years, I've done a lot of speaking to students um, at high school, middle school, college level, uh, pretty much all over the country. Uh, talking mainly about hidden figures. Uh, that was the genesis of that. And um, since I wasn't in the movie, uh, I've kind of had to talk about how I got to NASA. Uh, in fact, I was asked that question once. I was at a meeting in Charlotte, North Carolina, and um, I was going to lunch with this couple. And as we were going, I said, you know, I grew up in Monroe, which is about 20 miles from here. And the lady in the front seat turned all the way around and looked at me and she said, how did anybody from Monroe ever get to NASA? <laughs> so I'm going to share a little bit with you about how I got to NASA. And I will tell you a little bit about what I did. But it's been mostly um, precipitated by the students coming up to me after the talk, speaking of how inspired they have been. Uh, with the story, with the movie, and everything. And so we would love to see our students inspired. We would love to see them work hard. And that is really what keeps me going. So um, I, um, I grew up in Monroe, North Carolina. And as I said, it's a, it was a small town just outside of Charlotte. Had about 7,000 people when I was there. And um, I was an active child. I was the youngest of five children, and the other four were all more than eight years older than I was. So um, I loved being outside. I loved sports. I was inquisitive about how things worked. I loved helping my dad with his car. And um, my, mother, my mother said that she gave me a talking doll when I was five years old. And she was a little disappointed that uh, I didn't play with the doll too much. I cut her open to find out why she talked. <laughs> so, 
So, uh, so that, was, that was sort of the way I was as a child. I, uh, the school in Monroe was right across the street from our house, and it was first through 12th grade, but they didn't offer a lot of mathematics. Algebra was the, algebra was the highest level of mathematics that they offered at the school. And um, I did okay with algebra, but my last two years of high school, my mother sent me to a boarding school, a Methodist boarding school in Asheville, North Carolina. And uh, at Asheville, at that school, the only mathematics class that they had that I could take was plain geometry. Uh, and so I took plain geometry my junior year. Uh, but when I took that class, I absolutely fell in love with mathematics. I loved the teacher, I loved how she taught the class, and I did exceptionally well in the class. And it was so in that class that I decided that I wanted to be a mathematician. And um, two years later, well, I will get to the next year first. Uh, that was in 1957. Uh, when I finished that. During my senior year at that boarding school, my job was to collect the morning newspaper and take it to the library and put it on the spool. Uh, October the 5th, 1957, I collected the morning newspaper and the headline says, the Soviets have launched a satellite into space. It is traveling at 18,000 miles an hour. It has come over us four times in the last 24 hours. Now, I don't know how many people in this audience went through drills like I did, but we went through drills in school during, uh, during that time and earlier at that time because we were afraid of the Soviets dropping a bomb on us. And so that sent chills through us and, uh, at that school, but it also uh, kind of made us proud that somebody had gotten to space. We made our yearbook have a space theme that year. And um, that was, so that was one of my big space events that I had uh, when I was still pr pretty young. I was 15 when I finished high school there. The, uh, I went off to college, coming to Virginia to college, uh, not really thinking about the fact that I didn't have much of a background in mathematics and saying I'm gonna major in mathematics. Um, but the students coming from Washington, D.C. and New York and Richmond and all of the bigger school systems had had calculus and analytical geometry and trigonometry. And I said, well, you know, I will have to start where I am and I'll have to learn it. But then my dad called and um, dad said, you know, Christine, I'm not sure that there are a lot of jobs for an African-American mathematician in 1958. He says, uh, I think you ought to get a teacher certificate. Now, I um, had, in my mind, uh, decided I wanted to be a mathematician. And I had this formula in my head, um, which I kind of said, it helps you get to your dream or your goal or wherever you're trying to get. And I had perceived of myself as a mathematician. I wanted to be a mathematician. Uh, and my P1 says, it's P to the fourth power, of course. P1 says, perceive of yourself in the career you want to get to. P2, plan what you need to get there. P3, prepare. In other words, work that plan. And P4, persist. Keep on going. Uh, get around the detours. Get around the roadblocks that you run into, because you will run into some. And so I had thought about all of that, and of course, I had thought about the fact that in P2, what do you need to do to get there? I needed to take a whole lot of mathematics if I was gonna be a mathematician, because I didn't have much of a background. And so I um, thought about that, and then I says, but I knew my dad was trying to help me. He wanted me to be able to get a job when I finished college. And, uh, so I said, I'm going to go for a teacher certificate uh, with a major in mathematics and a minor in physics. But the second thing I'm going to do is I'm going to take all of the electives that I earned during my college years to take higher level mathematics. And uh, that ended up with me. My senior year, I had 
I had done most of my requirements for teaching, and I had earned several, a number of electives that I could take. Except there was a modern geometry class that I needed to get the teacher certificate, and it was taught at the same time as advanced calculus, which I wanted to take. So I said, I, how am I going to get both of these done? I went to the school register and said, can I take them both? And uh, they allowed me to take them both. I attended the calculus class, and I got the book for the geometry class and just read on my own and only went to class to take the examinations. So I graduated. Uh, I taught that senior year student teaching in math, four math classes, higher level math classes, student teaching in physics, four higher level math classes. So I graduated with my teacher certificate and about 24 hours of higher math that was not required for me to teach high school mathematics. So uh, I went off to teach in uh, Central Virginia, and as soon as I got there, the teachers came to me and said, hey, we all go to Virginia State University in uh, Petersburg, right outside Richmond, because they teach in-service classes to teachers free. Would you like to go? I said, sure, that would be great. So we all went up uh, Saturday morning. It was about a 60-mile drive and registered for classes. And the year went well. Everything went very well that year. Two or three years later, I had married and I had moved back toward the coast in Virginia. Uh, and I was 80 miles from Petersburg. But I was the one that went to the teachers in that school and said, you know, Virginia State offers in-service classes free to teachers. Uh, who can I get to go up on Friday nights this year to take those classes? And I got one carload of, of teachers to go. And so we went up to class the, the first Friday night, and we registered. And uh, the, as far as I knew, the first semester went great. But then at the end of the first semester, every one of those teachers in that car came to me and said they were going to quit. And I said, well, you know, I can't quit. I, I don't want to quit. I want to keep going to this class. I don't want to drive 80 miles at night by myself, uh, 11 o'clock at night. But uh, I'm going to have to do it. I'm going to keep going. So I continued to the class in the, to the second semester. About two months later, my husband got word that he got a fellowship to Virginia State to work on a master's degree in biology. And I said, well, gosh, we, looks like we're going to be moving to Petersburg. Um, and so I went to my principal, and I applied to teaching jobs around Petersburg. I went to my principal uh, when I got one letter back and asked me for a letter of recommendation. And he said, uh, Sure, I'll give you a letter of recommendation, he said, but I want my contract back. He says, I don't want to be looking for a good math teacher in August. And so I said, okay, I'm going to get this job. I'll give you my contract back. So I did, and I never heard another word from that system that wrote me for the letter. So the next Friday night when I went to class, I went up to my math professor, who was the head of the math department, and said, it looks like we're going to be moving here uh, next year, and I'd like to know if you know of any jobs around here that I might look into. And he says, you're looking for a job. I said, yes. He said, um, let me take you across the hall and introduce you to Dr. Hawkinson. He's chairman of the physics department, and he's looking for a research assistant in aerosol physics. We went across the hall and met Dr. Hawkinson. And before I left that room that night, I had that research assistantship. I would be doing studies, research, and light scattering of non-spherical particles. And I was also going to earn enough money doing that job to get a, a master's degree myself. Now, when I was taking all of these mathematics courses, uh, I was always a little disappointed when I learned how to work the problems, but I didn't really know how the, what the problems were applied to. Uh, that's how, that's where the math teachers will tell you, the students will say, when am I ever going to use this equation? You know, what I have to learn this for? What good is it? And so forth. And I guess I was feeling that way because most of the applied mathematics problems were in the back of the book and we never got to them. 
So I decided to get my master's degree in applied mathematics because it, I, I had learned by my, uh, for myself that it was the connection between the mathematics and the real world, how the mathematics played in the real world, that connection really excited me, and that is what I enjoyed so much about the mathematics. And that's why I chose to get the master's degree in applied math. Two years later, as I was getting ready to graduate, uh, I went by the placement office at Virginia State, and uh, I said to the young lady that, you know, I'm graduating and I'm looking for a job, want to know if you had any, anything. She said, where in the world have you been? I said, what do you mean? She says, didn't you know NASA was here yesterday recruiting? I said, no, I didn't know it. She said, well, they were. Here, you fill out this application. I am going to mail it in to NASA myself. So I filled it out, and she mailed it in. And about three weeks later, I had an offer from NASA. So I, what I tell the students that I'm talking to them, if I had not taken those classes, been a go-getter and taken all those extra math classes, I would not have qualified to get into Virginia State College. I would not have qualified for that fellowship. I would not have qualified for NASA or any of them. Uh, if I had quit when all those teachers quit, I probably couldn't, would not have gotten that job. But it, it was only because I persisted and kept going that I was able to, to get that job at NASA. So I did not realize I was being hired as a computer, but I was hired in the reentry physics branch where the engineers in that branch had, before I got there, had um, calculated the speed and angle at which the space vehicles had to re-enter the Earth's atmosphere. And uh, so they had done all of those calculations for Apollo by the time I got there. And um, I actually did some calculations for some of the hypersonic wind tunnels that we had in the complex there, uh, the blowdown tunnels that they used to do the research uh, for the research that they had done in those areas. And so I uh, was assigned to the, the computer office. And uh, after a, several years of working in the computer office, and you heard this in my introduction, the, um, I said, you know, a lot of the equations that the engineers are working with are very much like the equations I worked on in graduate school. But I guess that's because they are engineers and I'm a mathematician. And somebody hearing me say that says, oh no, several of the men have mathematics degrees. And I said, is that right? Um, I would like to be doing that myself, working as an engineer. So I went to my supervisor and asked about transferring to the engineering section. And I was told, no, I don't think that's possible. I, you can't do that. So uh, I wasn't happy, but I went back for a couple of weeks and thought about it. And um, I said, you know, I'm going to go to a higher level supervisor and ask about the same thing. Uh, I knew I was taking a risk. I could have gotten fired for doing that. But I also had made up my mind that I would go back to teaching if I lost my job at NASA. And so I went to the director and I said, I'd just like to ask a question. I'd like to know why, when a male and female come here with pretty much the same background, the, ma the males are assigned to the engineering section where they give talks, they write papers, and they get promoted. And almost all of the females are assigned to the computer pool where they work for the engineers. The engineers would bring problems into the office for them to work on. Uh, they would, uh, you would also do plots in the office, uh, various things, do the, do the lettering for the final figures of the reports in the computer office. Uh, but anyway, the, the women were all in dead-end jobs because they didn't write reports, and that was the game for getting promoted at NASA. And um, he looked at me when I finished asking my question, and he says, you know, nobody has ever asked that question before. And I said, well, I'm asking it now. And uh, we talked a little bit more. And then I went back to my office. And within about three weeks, two to three weeks, I was promoted 
and I was transferred to an engineering section. And that was about 1972 or three. The United States had just passed a law that said there could be no commercial supersonic flight over the continental United States. Uh, and they had uh, canceled the SST program that the United States was working on, the English and French were working on, and the Russians were working on. The, um, the, here we have a picture of an airplane going supersonically. Uh, the first supersonic flight was in 1947, when Chuck Yeager went uh, supersonic in his vehicle. Uh, and, and that is when we found out about the sonic boom, and that is when we started trying to understand, or where engineers that were thinking in the early 50s and then 60s about how are we going to calculate these, uh, predict the sonic booms. Our computers were just coming out. Uh, we didn't have the codes that could, uh, the computers and the codes that could solve the uh, Navier-Stokes equations or the very complex equations about fluid flow. But this airplane is going supersonically. It has generated disturbances all along where the path where it has been. And all of those disturbances are contained within this mock cone on the nose of the airplane. Uh, so there are lots of shocks inside. Molecules have been moved out of the way of the airplane. The pressure inside that mock cone is higher than the pressure outside of that mock cone. And so where that mock cone intersects the ground is shown there at the back of the cone. And you see the pressure jump where it comes from the atmosphere outside of the cone to the pressure inside the cone. And when I explain this to students in school, I always use a balloon. That when I, that air in the, the pressure in the balloon is higher, when I pop the balloon, it goes at the speed of sound to your ears. And when that shock wave hits your ear, you hear the pop of the balloon. And that is the same thing that happens here. When that cone is drug across you on the ground, or if you were standing just in front of that, when that, you get into that intersecting area, you hear the sonic boom, or your house hears the sonic boom. And uh, so this is, um, this is what we were concerned with. Is there a way that we can make the sonic boom signature shown over on the, this side, we can make that not be as loud as it is because this is the jump in pressure and that is the, determines the loudness of the sonic boom. So, the, um, one of the things that, that uh, a lot of people have been thinking about, some very smart researchers, uh, Whittem, Whittem and Walkden, who were thinking about this problem in the early 50s, how can we predict the sonic boom when we, can, we don't have the computers to do the calculations and everything? They uh, decided that they were going to actually use linearized theory and geometric acoustics to try to come up with ways to um, equate a real airplane with a body of revolution, a projectile that's going at supersonic speeds. Is there some way they could use that knowledge and transfer it to this? Well, one of the things that um, Seabass and George, just about the same time I went into the engineering pool, they were professors at Cornell University. They put all of these ideas together and uh, came up with several equations that described a process for how you could predict what the equivalent area distribution of an airplane had to be for the sonic boom to be minimized. What we found out really was that the process that they had determined actually kept the shocks from coalescing because as the shocks coalesced from the different parts of the airplane, the shock got stronger and stronger. And so, one of the things Jones introduced to the, to the theories was, if you make the shock on the front of the airplane very strong, it's gonna move forward as it extrapolates through the atmosphere, 
And you're not going to get the other shocks overlapping with that. And so you likely would just take full advantage of the attenuation of the shock, and you would get a smaller shock when it reaches the ground. And that was sort of the basic theory that was used. And so this is the equivalent area distribution that, I, that came out of the report that Seabass and George used. I was given the report and told to write a computer program that you could actually get to the minimizing sonic boom, uh, the minimizing equivalent area to minimize the sonic boom. And so most of the military airplanes that were flying around had an equivalent area very much like the top curve here. The curves that were coming out of the computer program once it was established were smoother curves and looked more like this. And, um, and so we started, we started uh, once we got the code running well and understood what we were doing, we started designing airplanes. My first design of, of a wing and a, a body and a, uh, the wings of the airplane, the air the area, equivalent area that we calculated, once we designed it, we had codes in the branch that would calculate the lift and the area due to lift of the, of the volume, due to the volume of the uh, airplane also. So it's the lift and the volume that describes that equivalent area. Uh, my first design, the area looked more like this. And of course, after the, after the first design, you compare it with your target that you were trying to reach. And then you say, well, now, how do I change this design to drive that equivalent area back to the target I'm trying to reach? And uh, so it was an iterative process, and we did not have that programmed in any way. We had to change the design manually, go back and calculate the lift, calculate the area due to volume, and continue that process. And so that took several months for us to get that done. The, um, this is a Mach 2 design that I did. Uh, we made it once we matched the area. Uh, and this was just a flat wing, wing body, very simple wing body, uh, designed for Mach 2. And uh, it was about nine inches long. One of the problems that we ran into uh, with this process also was at Langley, the unitary four, supersonic tunnel is only four feet. And the theories that we used, assuming a body of revolution and everything, they would only want to get the data at a, uh, maybe 100 body lengths away from that model. Well, the first models that they, te that they tested in there were more like an inch long because to, get 100, to get data at 100 body lengths away from that. And so uh, as we were getting larger and larger models, we were not able to get that far away. And so we were probably introducing some error into the designs because of the extrapolation. We were not getting the full three-dimensional <coughs> effects into that. And, uh, but we, we uh, tested this model in our four-foot wind tunnel. The model is, is in the middle of the tunnel. A pressure probe is on the wall. And there's a second pressure probe up top. And as that model is moved forward, of course, the air is, is blown past the model at Mach 2. And as the model moves, that cone that was on the nose of the model forms on the nose of the model in the wind tunnel. And as the model is up forward, then that inside the cone overlaps this pressure probe. So we get the higher pressure inside the cone measured here, and the pressure inside the tunnel outside the cone is measured here. Uh, we tested the low boom models, we, two low boom models this way, but we also tested a plane delta model that most of the military supersonic planes had, and it gave, again, a, a big N wave, as we uh, remembered that. And so um, we continued to do these tests for many years. We actually started working with McDonnell Douglas and Boeing and um, some of the other folks, uh, the other NASA centers. We took some of our larger models out to Ames and used their 11-foot unitary tunnel and, uh, in, in working these processes. Uh, and after doing this, uh, we also considered were we measuring the correct thing in the 
wind tunnels themselves, in the, in the signatures themselves, working with the people in acoustics. We put computers in people's houses so that they could give reactions to computer-generated noises. And we went to White Sands and tested extrapolation from 50,000 feet in a quiet atmosphere and in a very turbulent atmosphere to see uh, if the computer's signature was totally destroyed in that kind of environment. But after a number of years, and we were actually getting good results with more sophisticated models, cambered wings, engines, and everything on here, we decided, you know, we needed to do a flight test uh, to, to, to check these things out. And so uh, we went to the Air Force and borrowed two F-5 vehicles, and we put, model, we put panels on one of the F-5s such that we had the equivalent area distribution of the target equivalent area that we needed. This is the unmodified F-5. This is the modified F-5, which was called the boom demonstrator. And this is an F-15, which was measuring the rays off of these vehicles at, altitude of, at the altitude of flight. Measurements were taken in, with other airplanes on the way down, and on the ground, there were microphones on the ground. <laughs> The day, that this, uh, the day that this test was done, when the data was piped into the control center at uh, Dryden Research Center, you heard shouts just like when John Glenn came safely black, back from orbit uh, in 1962 when he was coming in from his first orbit. And that is because this airplane generated a big N wave this airplane generated a much sh shorter shock and sort of a flat top, which is what we were expecting it to generate. And, uh, and so we said, this is a success. This, this looks like it's gonna work. Now, but this doesn't look like a supersonic airplane. This, uh, it looks more like a porpoise. <laughs> so uh, what we next need to do is have a, a real airplane designer design a full-size airplane Supersonic airplane with the it, uh, best characteristics of a supersonic plane and integrate with that the characteristics of a boom designed plane, one that uh, concerns about the, uh, the loudness of the boom. And uh, so that was in 2002 when this test was done. The last year, Lockheed Martin was given a contract for $247 million to, uh, for this airplane, the QUESST that they had designed, which was the integration, of course, for the supersonic airplane and uh, low boom design. So this is the low boom X plane that NASA is having built. They, they are already working on building it. They expect that it will be completed in 2021, and then it will go through all of its supersonic characteristics. They did some low-speed tests on it at the uh, wind tunnel at Langley last summer. Uh, after they uh, do that, they will then begin to fly that airplane over people in different areas of the country, all over the country, and get data back on their reactions to the noise. Now, they're telling us that it will be just like a short rumble of thunder. Uh, we'll have to get flown over and give our response to how it really sounds to us. But um, so they're gonna, they will spend the next five, six, seven years going through all of these tests. NASA would then take all of the results of these tests to the FAA and ask them to consider a rule change. And um, if the rule is changed, of course, then it, it is our belief that the, the uh, business airplane companies and maybe Boeing um, and some other, other companies would build a supersonic airplane, commercial supersonic airplane, and the airlines would begin to buy the supersonic airplanes and uh, be able to fly from coast to coast here in about three hours. It, it is always that statement that I get when I get a reaction from the audience. But uh, so this is, I'm very excited about this and I, I hope it works. I, uh, I'm very excited about it being done, but uh, it is part of the process and um, it is part of the story that I tell the students. Now, uh, when I go and speak to the students, uh, I um, am trying to encourage them to 
That, that wasn't what I was supposed to hit. Uh, <laughs> Anyway, I, now I'll go back. Thank you. Well, I guess I don't have, have it there. The, the uh, final thing I wanted to say was, when I talk to the students, I, um, I ask them, you know, why, why a lot of them aren't going in STEM careers. I have some theories. I know that a lot of elementary school teachers did not like math and science when I was coming along being trained. Um, so I think, I actually feel that in some instances it has been the teachers in the classroom that have kind of dissuaded the students. I know that there are counselors who tell students, girls don't do math, girls don't do this. Uh, and I think that that is uh, sending a poor message. And I always tell the parents that they should not allow people to tell their daughters that. Let their daughters under, you know, decide what it is that they like, what, they, what it is they think they would like to develop in, in what they like. Um, even though my dad told me to be a teacher, I never, once I started working for NASA, I never heard him criticize the fact that I did not teach very long at, at all. He was very pleased with the job I did and the work that I did at NASA. But uh, I tried to uh, tell the students, look at the number of high-tech jobs we have in this country. And uh, look at the money you spend going to college. Uh, most of the time, you will find that if you've got a STEM background, you will find that the job that you can get straight out of college, if you've got, if you've got engineering or a STEM uh, area, you're going to make more money than a lot of students who do not have that background. So that is certainly one area, one uh, reason why you should continue your STEM uh, direction, especially if it interests you and especially if you have the ability. Uh, one of the things I really think about is, uh, and, and a lot of this is the high-tech companies, say, out in the Silicon Valley, who say they cannot find American students to, to hire into their jobs. And they are bringing in a lot of students from uh, the Far East uh, and India uh, who are working in those jobs. And so I'm, I'm, I ask the students, are you saying that the students in those countries are smarter than you are? No, we're not saying that. And I said, I don't believe that. But you've got to take the right classes. You've got to work hard in those classes so you too can be qualified to get those jobs in those companies. So uh, this is part of what I tell them. Uh, we've talked a lot today about working with other countries. We are getting ready to have a lot of countries in space. We do need our young, bright people in this country prepared to do the work that will be required in space. And that is all of our students. Um, so we need, we need to improve our public schools. We, we need for them to be top notch. We need for our teachers to be well qualified. Uh, a, lot, a lot of our people, our teachers quit teaching within two or three years, uh, the people who have degrees in mathematics, and then we put people in the class who had maybe one class of mathematics. Uh, and so there are things that we have done to our schools which are actually pretty bad. I heard of scripted teaching when I was uh, writing a paper for my church about the public school system, and that is a book written by businessmen which is telling the teacher what to read during the 60-minute class what to say 15 minutes into that class. I can't imagine trying to teach a student something about mathematics and think I can read it from a paper and that they're going to learn it and that they're going to enjoy it. The student needs to have a teacher who actually enjoys the subject that she's teaching. And uh, so I think that we've, we've because we, we are sending a lot of our technically trained people into industry and they're not in the school systems, we're not preparing a lot of our students uh, to be able to go into the STEM areas successfully. So these are the reasons that uh, 
I have given to the students that they need to continue the STEM areas because we are becoming more and more high tech and uh, the students in those countries are outscoring us on many of the examinations and we have the students who if they take the right courses, if they do the right work, if they have the right teachers, they too can do that work and uh, America doesn't have to be sitting where it is. So I, um, I believe the students always come up to me after I have spoken with them and they always say how inspired they are to know that women did the kind of work that was in the movie or the kind of work that I've talked about. And I believe that uh, I have kind of explained to those students my passion in the speech that I've given. I had a wonderful career. I enjoyed, I enjoyed especially once I had transferred into the engineering. I really enjoyed the work I did. I gave papers in Japan and Greece and Germany and uh, England and France. And I actually worked on uh, using the TU-144, which was the Russian supersonic airplane that they never used as a passenger plane. The United States actually rented that plane when Al Gore was vice president. And we did some supersonic tests using that plane on some of, our, uh, some of the things that we needed. So um, I'm terrible with timing myself. And I got all tacked up uh, with the papers I have up here. So uh, thank you again for having me here today. Uh, my presentation has been very different than the history of USRA, but uh, I learned a lot there and I remember hearing a lot about that. And I hope that perhaps something I've said has also been meaningful to you. Thank you. I'd like to offer the audience a chance to ask at least one question. I know we're running a little late. Bill. Probably what you'd expect from an old NASA guy, but a technical question. <laughs> and that is when we tried to get NASA to invest in some of these areas for uh, supersonic technology. That was after, several years after SST was canceled. And the only thing that folks on the Hill would uh, allow was to work the environmental issues. So mm -hmm. boom, which you mentioned, how much overpressure can you take? Noise around airports. And then the other one was you envision a fleet of these supersonic aircraft. What does it do to the ozone later? Because they fly at those higher yeah. altitudes. Yeah. Have we been able, and so they considered those the barrier issues to being able to make an SST work. Has a progress been made on that? You know, uh, the ozone, I remember when I started, there was a lot of discussion about ozone. Uh, but I have not heard much about it recently, so I really can't answer that. Um, but the environment, I, I was present when I showed this model, we, we went through a gap of about eight years. And then the funding came in for the environmental issues. And that's when we brought in sonic boom experts from all over the country to make sure we were taking the right approach to, 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 to try to attack this problem. And uh, we went back through old reports and found professors and people, uh, you know, everywhere we could find them to come, come in. And that's where we came up with the three-pronged area, the design and operation of the airplane, the acceptance of the noise by the people, and the extrapolation of the signature through 50,000 feet of atmosphere. So that, that was, those were the three prongs that we approached the last part of the program with. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Let's thank uh, Dr. Gard again. For